Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Thank you for being here on time. <laughs> for those of, that kind of come in late, they'll be busted because I think they're going to be on video. Yeah. So we'll know who they are. <laughs> uh, my name is Alice we'll Schillingsberg. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> I won't take that. It's a boo against me. <laughs> um, my name is Alice Schillingsberg, and um, as Kobe said, I'll be, um, I'm going to be talking about the importance of motivational variables in interventions with children with autism spectrum disorders, and I'm going to try to cover a lot of material in 90 minutes, and just as a quick disclaimer, because I think we're allowed to give them, this is also the first time that I'm giving this presentation, so it's a little rough, um, but I'm going to try not to go too fast or too slow. Um, and hopefully we'll get through everything. And I've got some really nice, uh, adorable videos, so you'll forgive me for any of my blunders. Mm -hmm. OK, so any good presentation on ASD starts with the obligatory slide that tells you what you all already know about individuals with ASD. Um, I thought about leaving this slide out because we're all very familiar with the population. You're probably interested in this um, topic today because you work with this population. But then I changed my mind and decided to include it anyway because everything that we're going to talk about throughout the 90 minutes today um, specifically address some of the unique features that we see in individuals with autism spectrum disorder and they're um, specifically uh, related to these core features. And then also we have a new DSM that's out and I'm no expert in the new DSM uh, as of yet but um, the, the slide looks a little bit different. There aren't the three main characteristics. It's now been condensed down into the two. Um, you can see that uh, persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction. They're sort of putting the um, social com uh, communication and social um, impairments together Together. and then of course your um, restricted stereotype patterns of behaviors. We also see some associated fe uh, features with individuals with autism. We certainly see adaptive skills deficits. Um, most everyone in here is familiar with the problem behaviors that we often see with individuals with ASD and these are often related to those communication deficits. And we're also um, probably uh, very aware of um, the impairments in motor imitation that we see with the kids, kids that we work with as well. But again, I, I wanted to highlight um, the main features of social communication and social interaction because as I'm going through the treatment procedures um, that I'm going to be suggesting might be beneficial, um, you'll see how those uh, tie in directly to this feature of ASD. Okay, so we're all uh, aware of behavioral interventions, that behavioral interventions work to address the core features um, as well as the other associated features. And most behavior analysts who work with individuals with ASD um, and most uh, treatment, I guess, packages um, that are behavioral in nature suggest that they prioritize the acquisition of language and social behaviors. And I would argue, and probably most people would argue, that these are inextricably linked. You can't really target language without targeting social behaviors, and you probably aren't targeting social behaviors without also targeting um, language. And for some of you who have seen me present in the past, I like to show an example of what I mean by um, language and social behaviors being um, being connected by telling a story of my niece and my nephew. This is one of my favorite stories to tell, so if you've heard it before, bear with me and giggle anyway. And if it's new to you, hopefully you'll find it as amusing as I do. So let me introduce you to the people having the conversation. You'll see my five-year-old nephew, Peter, climbing a tree. Uh, that's pretty indicative of his behavior, always getting into something. And then my adorable two-and-a-half-year-old niece, Sue Hyla, in hot pink high heels, also pretty telling. Um, about her. And then, of course, you need to know about their mom, my sister, Anne. And this is a conversation that took place at the lunch table at her house. And um, of course, she posted it on Facebook, <laughs> which is how we all communicate these days. So this is, I'll let you read it for yourself. I assume they can see this at home. Or do I need to read it? OK, great. <laughs> so cute, very, very cute. When you look at this conversation, it tells you a lot of things about communication. Communication is funny. It develops in a funny way with little kids, lots of little errors that are going on in language acquisition. 
Um, it also tells you that communication is complex. When we look at this from a behavior analytic perspective, there's really only one verbal exchange here where you can really identify a tangible reinforcer, and it's this one. I want red ketchup, I hate yellow ketchup. What she's communicating here is that she wants ketchup, but she doesn't like mustard and doesn't want anybody to put that on her hot dog. We can identify that. When you look at the rest of the conversation, it's not so clear. What's the reinforcer here? What's maintaining these, this social communication exchange between uh, my niece and my nephew and, and my sister? And it's social. Language is acquired and maintained because of social reinforcers and they're everywhere. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is as behavior analysts we have to constantly be thinking about that and thinking about how we're going to establish skills that are going to be maintained in the natural environment using naturally occurring reinforcers and thinking about autism specifically and one of the core features of the disorder being a very significant social impairment, a deficit in social reinforcers. And how are we going to keep that in mind when we're programming our interventions for kids, kids with autism? So I'd like to show this example um, before moving on. Uh, so. Autism spectrum disorders, as I've mentioned, have a sort of that unique feature, or um, some are, uh, I guess, speaking of it as sort of a hallmark feature, um, being the social communication deficits. And there's been some research into social communication deficits associated with autism. And some have hypothesized that um, ASD is, um, is sort of a product of a social motivation impairment. And what this basically means is that um, we have individuals with ASD who have um, essentially experienced social stimuli in a different way than we do. Um, so there's a decreased reward value attributed to social stimuli. And because of that, from infancy through development, um, what you see is less attention to social stimuli in their environment, which might result in less meaningful interactions with their social partners. And so they're not keying in to the salient features of what's going on in an interaction. Um, because, and then as a result of that, you may get less learning from social interactions or in situations where the social stimuli are the natural reinforcers, which is basically everywhere. Um, and because of that, you start to see that um, individuals with ASD uh, have a history of interacting with others that result in limited reinforcement and in some cases, actually punishment. Potentially, they're experiencing social interactions not just as neutral, but potentially as punishing. And so what we have from infancy through early childhood and then um, on up is that new behaviors, all of the behaviors that you and I learn, language, all sorts of things, are actually tr a being taught using completely ineffective natural reinforcers because we're relying on social reinforcers to teach these behaviors. So most people um, probably are very familiar with the ABLES or the VB maps. A lot of people are using both of these. When we look at an ABLES profile, if you're not familiar with the ABLES, this is essentially the ABLES R uh, grid looking at um, a variety of skills that are typically assessed uh, when we're going to work with, with kids with um, language deficits and skills deficits. And it tests um, or looks for skills in a variety of are areas, visual performance, receptive language, imitation, vocal imitation, imitation, uh, mans or requests, tax or labels, and, and interverbal skills. And so when you look at a grid like this, as you see all of the boxes or all of the skills filled in, meaning that these skills are present, this is what we might see in a, a typically developing four and a half, five year old child. Those of us who work with the ASD population are probably more used to seeing an ABLES grid that looks something like this, maybe a little bit more filled in, maybe a lot less filled in, depending on the type of, of child that's presenting to you. And as I think about the way that a typically developing child acquires all of these skills and gets all of these things filled in, normally there is a great reliance on social reinforcers to get those things um, uh, to occur. When we look at the kids that we work with, a lot of times, go back and flip through the ABLES that you've given in the past and look at A14, A15, A16, and A18 and see what, what those look like. And in general, you're probably going to see that they are not all filled in. And what these areas are, are referring to 
social reinforcers, social interaction. So A14 assesses, does the individual respond to an instru to instructor interaction as reinforcement? Is the interaction itself the reinforcer? Do they look to the instructor for feedback? Do they care about the feedback that they're getting? Are they responding to social reinforcers? And do they seek approval for task completion? And if you think about all of these hundreds, if not thousands of skills that we're going to be teaching the kids that we're working with, and wanting them to maintain in the natural environment, A14, A15, A16, and A18 are crucial components to making that happen. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? What I've, um, in be behavioral interventions are the mostly, most widely used interventions for individuals with ASD. Um, both comprehensive and targeted behavioral interventions have been shown to improve communication, social um, behaviors, as well as decrease problem behavior. There's been a pretty significant um, increase f on looking at uh, larger sort of behaviorally based treatment packages in the last couple of years. You can find um, some uh, controlled trials that are starting to be done. Um, and it's really getting a lot of attention. And even those treatment packages that maybe go by a different name, when you really get into the manual, almost all of them that work cite applied behavior analysis as a core foundation. Now, they may have some other things in there as well, um, but that tends to be a core foundation of what they're doing. There are numerous variations in behavioral interventions, but as I said, they're all sort of sharing these core principles. They're looking at antecedents and consequences for the behaviors that they're trying to teach, language and social skills. Most of them are skill-based, um, developmentally sequenced um, is as appropriate, and using some pretty tried and true evidence-based procedures such as prompting, fading, shaping, chaining, differential reinforcement, all of those things. But additionally, in the last several years, couple of um, say 20 years or so, there's been a, a real push and an increase on focusing on motivational variables in those interventions. Um, and motivational variables during intervention are, I think, are incredibly important for skill acquisition, they're important for problem behavior reduction, and they're going to be very important for improving that social relatedness and social interaction piece that's hallmarked to a diagnosis of ASD. Um, so what we're going to cover today, I'm, I'm going to try to cover three broad areas where you might want to assess and really work to include motivational variables in your interventions. Uh, so we're going to talk about methods to identify signs of motivation um, when you're working with kids, uh, methods to improve motivation for social interaction, um, trying to lessen problem behavior during teaching sessions, and then also um, methods to manipulate motivational variables during teaching, specifically during teaching MANS. Um, and that's, that's ambitious, but that's what I'm going to try to cover today. <laughs> okay, so I've been throwing around the term motivation here and there. Um, I think everybody knows what we're really talking about here, motivating operations, and um, Dr. Bailey had, had attributed or alluded to this earlier in his uh, presentation, that motivating operations are absolutely crucial to, to think about in terms of evoking behaviors um, when we're working with, with individuals. So just a little bit of theory and then we're going to go right back into applied. Um, so motivating operations, essentially this is the, the straightforward definition. A motivating operation changes the reinforcing effectiveness of other stimuli. It might have a reinforcing establishing effect, so it increases something as a reinforcer, or it may have an abolishing effect, so it decreases something as a reinforcer. And motivating operations then, of course, change the frequency of the occurrence of behaviors that have been associated with those reinforcers. And this is called the evocative or the abative effect. So if your reinforcer value has been established, it's going to evoke behaviors that have led to those reinforcers. If, um, uh, if there's been an abolishing effect where the reinforcer is no longer uh, valuable, then it's going to have an abative effect and the occurrence of those behaviors um, are going to, to decrease. So you're going to have a change in the frequency of the behavior one way or the other. So we talk about these things as establishing operations or abolishing operations. And just a quick example, um, you may have an establishing operation of food deprivation. This increases the value of food as a reinforcer and therefore evokes behaviors or increases behaviors that have led to food in the past. Pretty straightforward. Um, probably not telling you anything you don't already know. On the flip side of this, we have the abolishing operation. So as opposed to food deprivation, you may actually have food satiation. So at the end of an hour-long Thanksgiving lunch, 
we may all experience this, the, um, unless you've got delicious pumpkin pie, but um, for the most part, we may experience satiation. This decreases the value of food as a reinforcer at that particular time and decreases behaviors that have led to food in the past. Okay. Back to motivation. So that's our, that's our theory. Let's start talking about some application. So when I talk about motivation, it's really, I think, useful to think about it as an in-the-moment value of a, of a particular item or activity. Um, and is often dependent on context. So as we mentioned, satiation and deprivation are the things that sort of come to mind right away. Um, but there are some other variables that are going to affect your motivation in the moment. Uh, novelty. Um, that might pique an interest. I haven't seen this before. What is it? Um, uh, needing items in the moment. So I may at this point have a bowl of ice cream and no spoon and I need it. But later, if I don't have that in front of me, I don't need a spoon. That's going to change my motivation um, in the moment. And then, of course, environmental conditions. As this room turns more and more into an ice box, some of you may be grabbing your sweaters and putting them on. That's an EO manipulation right there. So when we're thinking about motivation, a couple of things just to keep in mind. Motivation can be fleeting or it can be consistent. So in the moment doesn't necessarily mean that it's here and it's gone. It might be that, but it, you also might have a motivation for something for a consistent period of time. Uh, motivations can be strong or weak. Uh, and motivation is going to be affected by uh, access to the item. So you may be motivated for something and then when you get it, you don't need it anymore. Um, so lots of things to think about when you're thinking about motivation. So motivation can be re reduced if satiation occurs. So if I eat a whole bag of Cheetos, I maybe don't want any more Cheetos and I'm not willing to do anything to get any more Cheetos. I'm giving away that I actually like Cheetos. Um, motivation can be affected by the response requirement. I'll give you a dollar if you stand here for five minutes versus I'll give you a dollar if, if you stand here for five days. The reinforcer is the same. The response requirement is what has changed in this situation. And then, of course, competing items. Again, Cheetos. If Cheetos and crackers are available, I'm going to pick the Cheetos. But if there are only crackers available, I may go for the crackers. So things are going to change what, what you have a motivation for sort of in the moment. OK. So that brings us to sort of the first thing that I want to talk about today, and that's how do you identify motivation clinically? When you're in a session with the kids that you're working with, how do you know what, what the, the current in the moment motivation is for? Um, and how do, you, how do you make those decisions? And some, some of them are pretty obvious. I think um, probably thinking to yourself, I can, I can kind of tell. Um, and some of them are pretty obvious. So uh, we use the term indicating response um, to indicate that there's a motivation at strength and that is present. Um, and I talk about indicating responses as sort of all the different ways that a motivation can be conveyed. So it's a pretty simple way of just saying that a motivating operation is present and it has evoked a response that's indicating. Um, we call it an indicating response. These could be very clear, a vocal response. If I say I want Cheetos, probably pretty clear what, what, what I'm um, indicating for there. Reaching and pointing are very conventional gestures that we acquire um, as infants and can be used very easily um, uh, to indicate uh, uh, what, what item is presently um, increased as a reinforcer. But there's some other things that maybe aren't as easy to spot, aren't quite as overt or clear. Um, really just orienting your body towards something. So some of the kids that we work with don't necessarily have a point or a reach, don't use conventional gestures the way we might expect, but they do orient towards something. And so you could um, use that as an indicating response. Glancing at an item. So I might not reach and I might not point, but I might look at something. Uh, making eye contact with you, which is great. That's a, that's a great uh, skill to have. Um, some of our kids uh, may do something like returning to the last place or position where the item was delivered. So if you've got a kid and you're in a therapy room and over in the corner we were playing a game and tickle, 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 and now we've come over here and now you see your kid go across the room and kind of get down and that's where you just tickled them, that might be an indicating response that that's what they want to do again. Um, so looking for something that's not a, necessarily a conventional way um, to communicate that. And then, of course, just changes in affect and facial expression can be an indicator. Okay, let's see if I can do this. This is the test. We're going to watch a video. I went the wrong way. <laughs> okay, I did it. 
Um, so what I wanted to do is just show a couple of videos, and I guess I meant to say this before. I want to um, just uh, quickly thank all of the therapists and clinicians who are going to be shown in these videos, showing you exactly um, what, it, what some of these things look like, and then also thanking the families who did give consent um, for me to use their videos uh, for this presentation. Okay, so we're going to watch a video. Okay, let me rewind it. Whoops. What does she want him to be interested in? The ball. What is he interested in? The blocks. The blocks, yes. So um, what's going on here is that this kid actually has a pretty clear indicating response. Not only does he orient to the blocks, he walks over to them, grabs them, picks them up, brings them over, puts it here, and then walks back across, picks up the next one, brings it over, puts it down. I can pretty much predict what he's going to do next. I've got four blocks there. This is a pretty clear indicating response. And one of the things that I, I like to mention is that sometimes we have our behavior plans and our lesson plans and the things that we're gonna work on, and this is gonna be the fun ball activity, but it's not right now. In the moment, now this therapist is incredibly skilled. She's an incredibly skilled therapist, and she knows that playing with the basketball is often a very highly preferred activity for this child and is doing a pretty good job. Hey, look, I've got your ball, remember this? But sometimes what we really need to do is take a step back and do some really keen observation in the moment to try to figure out, is there a different way that I can use the current motivation that's going on to potentially try to get some responding for the thing that in the moment is the potent reinforcer? Likely had we come, walked across the table and put our hand on the block and then could deliver it as a reinforcer, we potentially could have taught some skills such as the sign or the word for block and that sort of thing. Um, and so I, I like to show this video because I think sometimes we can get caught up with what's supposed to be the reinforcer and we can sometimes forget to look and see what actually is the reinforcer in the moment. Let's see if I can do it. Okay. I'm not a, a Mac person. <laughs> okay, now I want to show one that's maybe not as clear. And let's see if we can identify the indicating response. indicating response yeah moved her hand right up here let's watch it again indication that this little girl wants to do that again um, and so this is not a, a point or a gesture it's not a vocal response um, but this is the way that she has in her repertoire currently to let this therapist know that I do like what you're doing I do want to do that again um, and so I like to point this out because the kids that we work with with significant language um, delays don't often use indicating responses that are super clear and we really need to be on the lookout for ones um, that are potentially pretty subtle okay let's see if I can get back to the PowerPoint I did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So I'm not sure why that's up there. 
I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. Um, so indicating responses, I think, can be extremely important when language is deficient. Um, as I mentioned, motivating operations affect the value of something as a reinforcer, and good intervention requires identifying that in-the-moment potent reinforcer. You have to know what's going to work now, not what works generally. Because if you're using what works generally, then a good portion of the time you might actually not be using good, strong, potent reinforcers during your um, during your teaching. And I like to think of indicating responses as sort of an overt sign of something that's potentially covert. I want to play with these blocks, and this is the indication that that is true. Um, and so, in, uh, so we really want to make sure that we're looking for those overt signs, as subtle as they may be. And I think that identifying indicating responses can really improve your teaching trials, specifically manding. And I want to talk about why some of our man training might need to be improved. How many of you have heard the term scrolling? Anybody not heard the word scrolling? One, okay. Well, it's a fancy way of saying erroring, <laughs> and most people are familiar with that term because we all experience it. Essentially what scrolling means, uh, the way that it's often used, is basically a tendency to guess by emitting several responses. So I see the candy, I want the candy, and I sign cookie, movie, candy. Um, and that's an error. So I'm scrolling through these responses, and typically they're not random. They're responses that have been previously reinforced. They have a history of reinforcing, and we've got a kid who's guessing their responses. And what this basically means is that the response is not under the appropriate stimulus control, and in the case of a man, it's actually not under the appropriate EO control. So potentially, there's an item, um, candy, and I'm signing cookie, possibly because I actually don't want candy, I want cookie. And I'm signing cookie in the presence of an EO for cookie, but there's candy present. And we as therapists are having to guess, is it an error? Should she be signing cookie, uh, candy instead of signing cookie? Or is there actually an EO for cookie instead of for candy? And the reason that I think indicating responses can be so valuable is because oftentimes we are having to guess what is the current motivation for so that I can do the correct man trial. And um, so what indicating responses can do is really help us help to make sure that we do the correct man trial in the presence of the right EO. I'm going to show you some examples of this. In addition to scrolling, sometimes we often see rote responding errors where it's the topography of the response that's, that's an error. Um, and the indicating responses, and we're, I'm going to show you some examples of this, can help us to prevent those rote errors. So how many of you, um, you're doing a man trial and the kid, uh, the kid that you're working with says the wrong answer and it, and they do that, it's almost like it's so fast you, can't, you couldn't prevent it or correct it if you wanted to. And so what's happening is um, the error comes out, you do a correction trial, great. And then the next time the error comes out, you do a correction trial. And then the error comes out and you do the correction trial. And it would be really great if you could get your trial in before the error occurred. And indicating responses can be incredibly useful um, to make that happen. Okay, so let's look at some, uh, some sort of graphical examples. This is an example of a, of a child who engages in scrolling. And um, I'm, not, this is, I'm not expecting you all to be able to replicate everything that I talk about today, so I'm going to give you the general procedures. So essentially what we have are just um, uh, two data paths here. We're, um, we're essentially looking to see when I offer an array of items and the child signs for an item, how often does that sign correspond with the thing that the child actually consumes? I'm looking for correspondence between his verbal behavior. So if I sign cookie, do I actually eat a cookie? Do I mean cookie? Is it correct? And so you can see I've got two data paths here. The open um, diamonds are if the child gives me an indicating response, so I point to cookie, then what does he sign? Does he then sign cookie or does he sign candy or something else? And Additionally, now I've signed, when I'm given free choice, is the thing that I select and actually consume matching the thing that I sign? You can see we've got a kid who's engaging in a lot of errors. He's pointing or indicating, reaching for something, and then signing, and it doesn't match. And then once he's signing and giving a free choice, he's eating something, and it doesn't match. This kid's signs are all over the place, tons of errors. We've identified we have a problem here. 
This is an example of scrolling. This is an example of what might happen with rote responding errors. So again here, um, just generally, this is a, a kiddo who um, essentially was using the right word to mand. So if he wanted Skittles, he said Skittles. If he wanted markers, he said markers. But the mand frame was the error. So what would happen here, we've got two data paths. The open um, triangles are using a correct mand frame. So I want Skittles. Give me Skittles. Can I have Skittles? And the closed is using this very, um, uh, very rigid rote responding error. And it sounded something like this. Do you want I want Skittles? Do you want I want Skittles? Because that's been shaped up. So essentially an adult in his life says, do you want Skittles? And then he would say, echoing back, do you want Skittles? I want Skittles. <laughs> um, essentially sort of this error. And so pretty much across the board, even though he's telling us the thing that he wants, he's engaging in this rote responding error. So how are we going to use indicating responses to address those two issues? Uh, indicating responses, I think, can increase the chance that your MAN trial is being conducted under, an appro under appropriate EO control. Because indicating responses are responses that are already in the individual's repertoire. You're not teaching anything. Really, all you're trying to do is find them. You're just trying to identify them. So an indicating response is already in the person's repertoire, and in the presence of the indicating response, you can then do the correct MAN trial that corresponds with what they're indicating to. So it increases the chances that the correct EO precedes the correct response. And this isn't a problem with other types of language. So if I say, you know, what is it, and I hold up a pen, 100% of the time, the correct antecedent precedes the word pen, because I know what the antecedent is. If you can't identify indicating responses, you may be guessing the wrong EO. And so you're teaching cookie when the EO is for candy, and you're teaching movie when the EO is for, <laughs> was for cookie. And so now we've got kids that are having a proportion of their trials that actually aren't being done correctly. So if we can identify some indicating responses, we might increase that sort of correspondence there. Um, okay, indicating responses can also signal that, that, that you should actually do a man trial now. Um, keeping in mind that indicating responses can be very subtle, um, but let's take, a, let's take an example of, or take a look at a video um, of the little guy um, that I was talking about who did the do you want, I want, okay? Let's see if I can do this again. Whoops. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, so the first one is pretty, whoopsie. I didn't mean to do that. Okay. So let me just tell you really quickly about this little guy. So as I mentioned, he's, what we're working on here are correct man frames. He's giving me this rote error that's happening. And so indicating responses, essentially, his indicating response is a man, a vocal man. So we know he wants something because he says, do you want, I want gummy? Do you want, I want marker? That's how we know. And so basically what's happening is he's getting sort of 50-50 teaching. He's getting 50% errors because he says, do you want, I want? gummy, and then we correct it. So for every error, there's a correction. For every error, there's a correction. And we had tried for a very long time to just see would that work it out, work itself out, and it doesn't. He's being allowed to practice that error over and over again. So what we're doing here with his therapist is essentially you're going to see his therapist really looking at him. He is observing him very closely because what he's looking for is an indicating response that occurs before the vocal error so that he can do a, a trial with the correct mand frame before that error ever comes out. So what you're going to see is what this might look like. He uses textual prompts. So that's the written, written man frame there. Very sticky, huh? I can hear you chewing on it. He's just looking for an indicator for when he's going to want another one. And he's. 
very observant of him, not taking his eyes off of him. Did anybody see that indicating response? Unbelievably subtle. I'm going to rewind it a little bit, and I just want you to look at this little guy's face. He goes from playing with his sticky fingers to eyes to very serious. <laughs> you can see a very subtle but quick change in his facial expression. Let's see if I can do this right. Whoops. Oh, no. What did I do? Okay. Just watch his face. Yeah, it looks like an eye, huh? Hello. Hello. Two eyes and fingers. May. There it was. That was it. And this therapist and I had supervision pretty, pretty regularly because I wanted to know, we looked at video, what is it that's very subtle? Is there something that can tell us at that exact moment that the motivating operation comes to strength, right before he's about to say, do you want, I want clear gummy? Because we don't want that error happening anymore. And identification of this very subtle, he doesn't point, he's not reaching, he doesn't need to do any of that because he's vocal. He's had years of history of having his vocal responses reinforced. And so what we're looking for are these incredibly subtle indicating responses that can get um, that can allow this therapist to have truly errorless teaching and try to prevent that from, from occurring. That one was a tough one to identify, but we did. And so we went from this to this pretty quickly um, by preventing those errors from happening. These are just treatment probes. So there's actually no treatment going on during these sessions. We're just watching a session of 10 trials of sort of naturally occurring mans, it's varied in terms of length because you have to wait till the EO comes to strength to do the trial. But you can see pretty quickly we got those, the do you want, I want, gone. Um, and I don't think we would have been as successful if we kept relying on the do you want, I want to tell us when to do a man trial. Okay. Well, what about this little guy that we talked about who has the serious scrolling error? So there's one other thing that we need to assess here. Is this, a, is this an error in terms of, um, so we're, we're, we're looking for indicating responses here. We're already aware that that's going to be really important, but there's one other thing that we didn't really assess, or I haven't really assessed it, I just haven't told you about it, and that's how much does his indicating response correspond to what he consumes? So if I've got a child who's engaging in um, some pretty uh, inconsistent and difficult to understand indicating responses, we're going to have a hard time teaching signs because I can't even tell what it is that the child wants. And so what we have here in this data path is I may sort of reach or gesture or glance at an item, but then when given a choice, I actually consume something different. This is a completely different problem. This is I can't predict the thing that you want because the ways that you're telling me the thing that you want are actually inconsistent. And so the problem here is, bo is before we start teaching signs, we might want to strengthen some indicating responses so that we can actually do appropriate sign training. So even though we had been teaching some sign responses here, we went ahead and put that on hold and took a different approach and taught this child a clear point indicating response so that the therapist could predict from that response, um, when to do a trial and for what. And so what this looks like is, um, looks a little bit like this. So you can see that this is pointing as an indicating response. And I'm not going to go into a ton of the details about how we actually did it, but you can see we were teaching an indicating response from two feet away. So with the items just sort of right here, can the, end of it, the child point or reach to the item? And then actually the thing that he points or reaches to is the, actually the thing that, that he um, consumes. And so you can see the, uh, the black data paths are just fully physically prompting. We're just going to um, teach that uh, uh, with no errors and then um, switched over to a model prompt. And then when we got to independent opportunities with error correction, you can see at two feet and at four feet and then down at six feet 
um, we're starting to see very clear indicating responses from this child. Um, and so now that I have a good solid indicating response, my sign training might be better because now I've got something that's sort of a generalized response, but it lets the therapist know, oh, that's the thing that you want. Let's do a sign, tr a, a sign trial now. And we're increasing the chances that the sign that you're teaching actually matches the thing that the child actually wants. Um, and so that's what we're doing. So here you can see post-indicating post response training, we ran sort of the same thing. And you can see here that the indicating response is now matching the item that is consumed at least. Um, and we weren't looking at signs because as I mentioned, we put all signs on hold until we could get this solid. And now we're ready to start teaching signs um, again with this child. Okay. So now what I want to do is move on and talk a little bit about motivational variables in intensive teaching. So man, uh, man training, I think, and identifying motivations for man training is going to be incredibly important. We just talked about that. Um, but I, I think that probably everybody in here and probably a lot of people online have tons of experience using discrete trial training or discrete trial instruction within uh, kids with ASD. Um, and so I want to talk about how you can really think about motivational variables during your um, discrete trial instruction. Now, for those of you who aren't as familiar with discrete trial, essentially, um, kind of in a nutshell, discrete trial instruction is instructor-led. Um, it's intensive teaching that typically takes place outside of the natural environment. So um, you're, you're actually in a contrived sort of teaching session, usually sitting at a table, depending on the age of the child. You might be doing something different, but the environment is, is carefully controlled, and we sort of have this ABC teaching format with the antecedent, the behavior, the consequence. Um, that is the discrete trial, and it entails precise use of prompting, um, carefully planned reinforcement, and numerous, numerous, numerous numerous opportunities to practice. Um, okay, so what are some of the benefits of discrete trial? Why do we even use it? Um, as I mentioned, uh, in the beginning, we were talking about sort of the decreased reward value or reinforcing value of social stimuli. Sometimes with kids with um, ASD, what you start to see is a lack of paying attention to the salient features in the environment, which can make teaching in the natural environment incredibly different, uh, difficult. Excuse me. Um, and so um, for individuals who have difficulty attending to the salient features, this allows us very careful arrangement of the teaching materials. We can systematically increase the complexity of what we're um, presenting. Um, and allows us to sort of specifically teach these uh, little ones to, to hone in or focus in on the salient features of what it is you're trying to teach. Additionally, um, a lot of individuals with ASD have those sort of restricted interests and so, um, and don't often have social reinforcers that can be used and so this allows for careful arrangement of reinforcement and use of reinforcement um, which can be useful with those for, uh, who have limited reinforcers. We can really specifically work to condition social reinforcers um, and then I think also importantly is that structured adult-led instruction is everywhere and so having a child who can respond in instructor-led inter in intervention I think is going to be important for when they get to school for example. The limitations of course is that sometimes generalization is not built in. It's a contrived setting with contrived materials with contrived reinforcers. Um, the, some limitations, some people would suggest that um, the natural environment can't support those artificial reinforcers and that we see problem behavior, a lot of resistance to that sort of intensive instruction. Um, but we address those by programming for generalization. Uh, we address it by conditioning natural reinforcers and thinning our reinforcement uh, schedule. But I'm specifically interested in the problem behavior that occurs in response to discrete trial instruction. Discrete trial instruction is shown to be um, highly effective at teaching skills, um, but but continuing to see problem behavior during uh, discrete trial instruction. Um, I think can, can be a problem. Um, and so what do we do about that problem behavior? And some would suggest you might just use extinction, um, talking about let's just work through it, don't allow escape. And while I'm actually a fan of using extinction in combination with reinforcement approaches, I think that um, what I'll talk about today are some different things that you can do maybe um, in the beginning uh, before having to rely strictly on an extinction-based procedure. Using extinction also where you're 
doing an intensive teaching um, session and the child is engaging in escape type behaviors um, to escape working with you, um, I think might be contraindicated for a disorder whose hallmark feature is social relatedness difficulties. So if interacting with people socially is already an impairment, it's already something that I try to avoid, we potentially could be making that worse by forcing interaction that is potentially experienced as aversive. And I think I bring that up just to think about that um, as you're writing your programs for the kids that you work with. And you may get compliant responding, but that responding may be motivated to escape you. That if I do what you say, you'll let me go. And that, again, also may be contraindicated when the diagnosis is ASD. Um, so some, uh, it's been noted that we can, um, often continue to see resistance and problem behavior even if you attain, obtain compliance in discrete trial instruction. And it's been argued that this is because of the, that in the past there's been more of an emphasis on consequences, so escape and differential reinforcement, as opposed to really, and not as much emphasis on antecedents like motivational variables. Um, and so, um, even if you do use extinction and you reduce problem behavior, the motivation to escape is actually still there and may continue to pose a problem. Um, so what I want to talk about are motivational variables related to intensive instruction. And in order to do this, we're going to talk a little bit about the reflexive motivating operation. How many are familiar with the reflexive type? Motivating operations of the reflexive type. I know at least one person in here is. <laughs> Okay, well this will be your, uh, the lecture portion and then we'll move back on to some, some videos. Okay, so um, Jack Michael, of course, uh, has written a ton about the establishing operation and um, is, is an excellent source of reading. I think also you've seen some citations here for Carbone's to, and, and, and colleagues' 2010 paper. I highly recommend reading it, it is fantastic, and talks about um, how conditioned, um, reflexive conditioned establishing operations are so crucial to um, discrete trial instruction. So what is a CMOR? What is a conditioned reflexive op uh, motivating operation of the reflexive type? Um, so it's just like any other motivating operation in that it changes the effectiveness of something as a reinforcer and it evokes behaviors to lead to that reinforcer. But it's reflective, reflexive because um, the event sort of has an effect on itself. So let me give you an example. Um, so essentially what this means is that a CMOR is an event that establishes its own termination as a reinforcer um, or its own prolongation, so continuing as a reinforcer. And it's going to um, evoke behaviors that have led to that termination or prolongation in the past. Okay. Now that I've said all that, let me give you an example of pain. Pain can be um, talked about as a reflexive condition, mo uh, reflexive motivating operation in the sense that you experience pain, it, that event in and of itself um, increases terminating pain as a reinforcer. So I want to get rid of it. I want that to go away. And so it evokes behaviors that get pain to go away, like taking an Advil, drinking some water, having a meal, lying down, anything that might get that, that pain to go away. So the event itself establishes itself as something that you want to escape. Um, and that's what makes it reflexive. Um, a conditioned reflexive motivating, yes? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, this is exciting. Oh, I totally forgot about this. <laughs> okay, is it the last one? Uh, okay. So what of a child for whom the th Okay, yeah, so this question in a nutshell is essentially saying, what do you do with a child for whom the therapist and the family members have been unable to identify any reinforcers? Uh, f pretty severe food refusal, content to sit by himself, self-stimming. Um, I've also been asked to look, okay. So I, I think, um, that this is an excellent question and probably something that every once in a while does come up. And I think this is uh, one of the things that challenges us as therapists and clinicians to take a step back and try to identify what those reinforcers are. And I think even though it says that you can't identify any reinforcers, there's likely something um, that could be identified. It may just be something that um, doesn't immediately come to mind. So 
uh, you mentioned self-stimming. Um, some individuals, if there are some self-stimulatory behavior that you could um, make access to that uh, uh, contingent. Um, so for example, the very first video that we saw showed the little guy lining up blocks. Um, I don't think he wanted to play with the blocks. He didn't want to build a tower with the blocks, but he wanted the blocks in order to line them up. And that's self-stimulatory, potentially. It's the way he wanted to play with them and making acts. Um, and so potentially those blocks are a reinforcer if he's then allowed to do with them what it is that he wants to do. So I think that's a challenging question. I do also think that there's um, some literature on how to uh, to condition some reinforcers by pairing things that are neutral with things that are, are positive, but that's, that's definitely a, a unique, well not unique, but a, a challenge um, and I think requires the clinician to step back and you can't teach until you identify a reinforcer. Um, so I would be really um, looking for things even if they don't stand out as, as sort of, I think sometimes when we think about reinforcers we're thinking about like cookies and candy and toys and crayons, but essentially it could be some things that are a little bit on the, on the more stereotypical um, side for this population, and I might consider that. Um, the last question was the Carbone article, and it looks like somebody just answered it for me. Yes, the role of the reflexive conditioned motivating operation, it's an excellent paper. Okay, thank you for the signal. <laughs> I don't mean to neglect the online people, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, so now that we've seen the example of a, a reflexive motivating operation, something that, that uh, establishes getting rid of itself as a reinforcer, let's talk about how you might condition that. So what, this what a conditioned reflexive CMOR is previously neutral events that have been repeatedly paired with a worsening or improving set of conditions. And so via that pairing, the neutral event now takes on those aversive um, sort of characteristics and now um, uh, establishes terminating what used to be neutral, now it's experienced as aversive and terminating that aversive event is now going to be a reinforcer. And so let's look at the example um, of a teacher presenting uh, demand material. So if I were, um, if, if demands are the things that are, are aversive and um, I show up and I have no history with this child, essentially the, my presence is neutral. I'm the teacher or the therapist, I'm neutral. But now, every time the child interacts with me, it's come sit down, put your toys down, we're gonna do some work, you can have access to those toys once you've complied. Now, the, I have been repeatedly paired with these demands, and because of that, now the side of me, who used to be neutral, is no longer neutral, but I, um, I uh, increase getting rid of me as a reinforcer. So essentially, I'm reflexive in the sense that when I show up, I'm now motivated to get rid of you. It establishes terminating my interaction with you as the reinforcer and evokes behaviors that get you to go away, like hitting myself in the head, like destroying your materials, hitting you, having a tantrum, flopping to the ground, running and hiding under my bed if you're a home therapist, all those things. Those are signs that you are a conditioned reflexive motivating operation um, and should be taken taken seriously. It's an indicator of um, how you are experienced by the child that you're serving. So what do we do about that? Um, well, one of the things is to think about abolishing that. So just like there's an EO, there's an AO. There's a flip side to this. So what do we do? Um, what's suggested and what I'm going to talk about is modifying the experience that the child has with you as it results with um, in as it pertains to demands and I think the example that was given earlier today when I um, give you this harsh instruction that you have to follow changing the way that you say it all of those things that's a that's a motivating operation that's a change um, uh, that can that can evoke different behaviors from people. So what we suggest is that your teaching or your interaction should actually um, include less failure with instructions. And you might do that by using errorless learning, fewer opportunities to, to error, um, more frequent reinforcement um, by uh, reinforcing attempts and using shaping, and imp basic improvements in the way that your demands are presented. Um, Essentially, what we're suggesting is that alterations in the aversive or the unacceptable demand situation is warranted. You've got to change your instructional procedures if you find yourself in a situation where um, 
where you have been paired with, with this sort of worsening of conditions, as it were. Um, and then some suggest that if you just focus on using extinction to reduce the problem behavior without addressing the negative aspects of the interaction, that potentially that's unethical and that we shouldn't necessarily be forcing people to tolerate something that they find that aversive if there is something that you can do about it. And we have to do something about it because we all know discrete trial instruction is effective. We have to present targets. We have to teach. Um, but are there some things that we can do to modify this um, conditioned reflexive um, motivating operation? And so, uh, probably several of everybody's familiar with pairing. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about that um, quickly, and then we're going to look at some data. Um, so, essentially, pairing with reinforcement. Um, this is one way that we modify the condition motivating operation. So some of you may not have known that that's what you're doing when you're, when you're using pairing. Um, we're pairing the therapist, the site of you, the setting, your teaching materials, all of these things with positive reinforcers. We're assessing reinforcers and using them and we know what's a reinforcer because we're looking for indicating responses and we're letting the child tell us what is an effective reinforcer right now in the moment based on their indicating responses. Um, trying to avoid demands in the beginning and really uh, work to make the interaction with the therapist as an improving set of conditions as opposed to an aversive interaction. Um, and what this is meant to do is to try to make the therapist valuable and sought after, increasing interaction with you as an effective reinforcer and evoking behaviors that lead to interaction with you. I want to interact with you. Um, and ultimately trying to change the value of interacting with others. When we think about autism spectrum disorders and the hallmark feature being social impairment and social avoidance, this clearly gets at a hallmark feature of that disorder. And what we want to see is um, this type of arrangement evoking responding to continue to be with you. That's our goal. Additionally, um, just some tips on how to pair with reinforcement. I won't go through all of this. Of course, most of us know how to play with kids, but essentially it looks like playing. What it doesn't look like is sitting there and watching a kid play. Um, sometimes you see um, a, a kid playing with a bunch of toys and the therapist is completely irrelevant. What we want is for the fun interaction and the positive reinforcers to, to, to come through you. To, you're the vehicle, <laughs> uh, as it were, to, to sort of get at those things. Um, and so access to preferred items is essentially occurring through interaction with you. Okay. But pairing, you may be thinking, well, what do we do now? We've got to start teaching at some point. And so in um, Carbone's paper, um, which again I think is, is really wonderful, talks about the use of instructional fading and how this is also potentially modifying that reflexive motivating operation. Um, and that you have spent some time embedding positive reinforcement in sort of this pairing process. And now how are we going to get to the hard stuff? Because we've got to get hundreds, if not thousands, of trials in, right? We've got to get there somehow. And, um, so what he would suggest is instructional fading. Um, we all know, so removing demands is going to reduce escape behavior because it removes the thing that you want to escape. And, but now what we're suggesting is that you want to slowly start introducing those demands and you want to introduce them across a variety of dimensions. So not just um, the rate of demands, but also increasing the difficulty level and the response effort. So maybe starting with very easy demands to begin with and increasing the difficulty level, but also starting with um, infrequent demands and starting to, to slowly put those, those in. And this can help keep your escape behavior low. And then additionally, we would suggest that errorless learning, um, using uh, uh, errorless strategies, of course these are kind of blanket recommendations may not apply to everybody, but potentially an errorless strategy um, can, can help to keep escape uh, behavior low as well um, and would be suggested as a possible way to modify this um, condition motivating operation. Uh, and additionally, reinforcing attempts and focusing on shaping. Um, Okay, so let's look at a little bit of data. Um, this is a, a study that um, we did several years ago looking at just the effects of sort of that pairing procedure. Um, and again, uh, let me just give you the general rundown. Essentially, you've got sessions along the X, and what we're looking at here is percent of in-seat behavior voluntary in-seat. Nobody is physically guiding these kids to come and sit down. This is a kid who the, the, the behavior of coming to sit down has been evoked. 
here. Um, and so what you see are two different therapists. This is one kid with two different therapists, a pairing therapist and a non-pairing therapist. And in baseline here, it's just both therapists are presenting demands. One of those demands is come sit down periodically. If the kid's sitting, the demand isn't given. If he's not, I think the demand was given something like once every 45 seconds or something like that. And then other demands are given as well. So motor imitation, whatever it may be. And you can see percent of in-seat behaviors, eh, you know, it's kind of okay. I'm not going to really come over there, but maybe I'll test it out, and then this isn't that fun, so I'll see you later. Um, and so then what happens during intervention is one therapist completely stops giving demands and is just pairing. Again, no physical guidance to the table. The, the interaction with the therapist evokes that behavior, um, whereas with the non-pairing therapist, we get pretty much the same. Eh, I might come over and see, maybe you're going to play with me too. Nope, okay, well then I'm going to get up and go. And of course, you're, you would expect this. I'm gonna, you're going to play with toys and give me snacks. Okay, great, I'm going to come over. But what is, what's the effect once we go back to demands? Well, in the last phase, you can see, we did have a small drop there with the pairing therapist, but in general, even when the kid is experiencing the exact same conditions with both therapists, potentially the effect here of this pairing condition has led to or evoked more in-seat behavior. I'm, I want to continue to hang out with this person. Um, because of what I've done, because of this, this history of pairing. Now, if we were to run this out a bunch of sessions, we'd probably see it start to break down because we've just re-put in the original CMOR, right? We've just now started pairing ourselves with demands. And so this is potentially fleeting, but I think that this is very telling that it can have this immediate effect um, on a child's behavior here. Um, this is a little bit hard to see. This is the same kid, pairing therapist and non-pairing therapist. The non-pairing therapist is in the, the open data path, the pairing therapist in the black data path, and this is latency to sit. Let's look at these data paths separately. This is the pairing ther therapist. So latency, latency to sit is, when I see you, how long does it take me to get my behind in the chair? And you can see in baseline, eh, sometimes I'll come over, but I experienced it, it's not that great. And then what we see is, up here at 600 seconds, he never came over. I'm not going anywhere near you. Once pairing started, pretty much across the board, as soon as I see you, I'm in my chair. I'm coming over there. The behavior is evoked like that. And we don't see the same thing with the non-pairing therapist. We see a couple of times still trying it out, but for the most part, it's looking pretty consistent regardless. We also look at elopement. Uh, you can see, again, you know, uh, the pairing and the non-pairing therapist pretty much right around here. I was told not to do this, but I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> uh, right around session 25, attempts to elope are completely gone with the non-pairing, uh, with the pairing therapist, and even when the pairing therapist goes back to presenting demands, there's still no elopement. But we don't see that with the therapist who did not take that time to, to, um, to, to have that interaction um, with, with the child. And these are run essentially back to back. So um, you can see a pretty quick effect. Now, like I said, I have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there any research showing mixing and varying different types of skills or operands? Uh, yes, there is. And actually, um, whoever asked this question, if you take a look at the Carbone article, they actually talk about mixing and varying in there. Um, I just didn't have time to include that as a strategy in this particular presentation, but yes. Um, okay, so what happens, you know, so like I said, this is probably going to break down relatively quickly because we've just gone all the way back to just presenting demand. So how do we get this effect to hold up? How do we get it to continue? And this is where the other two things, instructional fading and errorless teaching, come in. So I want to show you more of a clinical application um, and kind of a treatment package that includes pairing, instructional fading, and errorless learning. And um, I'm going to show you just some clinical data. There's some slight variations between the kids that I'm going to show you. But just in general, what we outlined were sort of stages of this process in 10-minute sessions. So we, take, we have a 10-minute session with the child and in the beginning we're pairing only. Pairing is just sort of non-contingent access to toys. I guess the only contingency is that 
I'm there with you and delivering them, but you don't have to do anything. As a matter of fact, you could be engaging in problem behavior and we're still, it's an antecedent manipulation. So we're providing these um, uh, preferred items, reinforcers, there's no demands being done. That's the first, um, the initial stage. And then we're gonna start to slowly increase demands. And as each stage progresses, the demands are um, progressing from now you can have access to all the things in here, but you just have to stay at the table. You can get up and wander around. I'm not going to force you to sit at the table, but if you want these things, you just have to come, come over at your leisure whenever you want, and you can have access to things. Once we're through that stage, we start requiring some mans. We're going to start teaching you to, to ask for these things. Not a ton of demands, but starting to, to do that. And then now we're going to start putting in some other kinds of demands, motor imitation skills, puzzles, whatever it may be. But we're start just sort of gradually increasing these things. Um, so there's a slow increase in demands. Um, we're beginning to, to do things. And essentially, by the final stage, it sort of looks like 15 to 30 seconds of demands, one right after another. And then you have, a, say, a 10-second reinforcement interval. You go right back into teaching, reinforcement interval. Go back into teaching, reinforcement interval. And you do that for 10 minutes. OK, so let's take a look at what this looks like. Um, Okay, so we've got, essentially here we have our blue data path down at the bottom is uh, basically inappropriate behaviors. For this child, it's disruptive behavior and elopement, um, and these are responses per minute. The red data path um, ties to the other axis over there, and this is percent of session in seat. So you can see it goes from 0% up to 100%. And we do a quick baseline check, kind of, like, what, you know, what happens if we just start teaching this kid? So he just starts in the clinic. We just want to know. Maybe we could just start teaching, and we're going to have a great time. It's going to be great. So we started at, um, for this kid, stage six. I don't have the exact details on that. But for the most part, what that looks like is it's a 10-minute session. There's lots of preferred items available, but the child has to be in his seat. Um, and we're doing some demands, motor imitations, receptive commands, whatever may be appropriate for this kid. Um, and what you can see is um, he starts to engage in some problem behavior, and he starts to get out of there. I'm not sitting here. This isn't that great. I'm up and I'm out. Okay, so we take a step back and say, okay, well, this is a kid that might benefit from the treatment package. So with this child, um, it's, it's labeled stage three. Essentially, all that means is that um, we skipped one and two where we were not doing requiring mans and just went straight into um, pairing and mans. That's it. That's all we're doing is playing and some man trials. And pretty quickly, we progress all the way up to stage six and then even further and by stage nine what it looks like is a pretty typical teaching session and you can see we have almost no problem behavior no resistant behavior here um, and really high rates of again voluntarily sitting in their seat so these kids are not physically guided there's no three-step guided compliance necessarily requiring um, in-seat behavior but we get it pretty quickly here let's see how long would a typical pairing process of non-contingent access to reinforcers last? That's a great question. Um, so this first stage um, where it's just sort of non-contingent, essentially we're going to let the child's behavior tell us that. So if during non-contingent, um, the non-contingent stage, you're still seeing elopement attempts and tantrums and things like that, you're probably not then ready to start putting demands in place. Um, so you can see in stage three here, we're pairing and doing some man trials, and the last three sessions is 100% in-seat behavior and no, um, no resistant behaviors here, no disruptive behavior. That let us know, let's go ahead and try the next phase. And so we're letting um, their, the child's response to what we're doing to tell us when we're ready to go. Let's look at another kid. Uh, so again here, um, we did a quick baseline check. Baseline just means, what if I just start teaching? Is this a kid who can tolerate a, an intensive teaching session? Um, and you can see this kid looks a little bit different. He actually sat in his seat. He you know, came over um, and, and is sitting, but we're seeing some resistance behavior. Um, and his included disruptive behavior, aggression, tantrums, and elopement. Um, not much elopement because he's sitting, but for the most part, we've, we're seeing some resistance. And now, you know, one per minute, that's not a ton, but that's enough for me to say maybe we need a different approach, and I certainly don't want it to get any worse. So let's take a, stage, a step back, and we actually started with stage one with this kid um, where 
non-contingent access, he can go anywhere in the room. We don't care where you take your reinforcers, we're coming with you. And then pretty quickly, by phase two, now all the stuff is at the table. He can come and go as he pleases, but he can't take the reinforcers from the table. That help, um, helps keep kids at the table and making that choice. I can get up and do nothing or I can come and play with you. By stage three, we're starting to, in, uh, to, uh, to implement some man trials. And you can see he's starting to have to do a little bit of work. And we get a little bit of resistance there. Um, but again, we're looking for low problem behavior toward the end of the phase before we start upping the ante. And you can see, um, you know, we, we're not having any problems with in-seat behavior. We have a little bit of problem behavior in the middle. Stage five and six is really where we start to increase a little bit more of the demands. But by phase nine, um, the end of phase nine, it's looking pretty good. We've got pretty low problem behavior. Um, and really great in-seat behavior without really having to use a ton of extinction-based, work through it, come and sit down, attend and comply types of strategies. Uh, this is another profile that we sometimes see. No problem behavior really at all, um, but really not, not wanting to stay. In, the problem behavior that we're seeing is sort of elopement. Um, so uh, essentially what we're looking at here um, or not necessarily elopement, but not coming to the table at all. So we're looking for kids who voluntarily want to come and interact with us. They're seeking out interaction with us, not us forcing them to come and sit and comply. Um, and so you can see he's not engaging in aggression and SIV you know, any of that stuff, but he's not voluntarily coming over because when he does, we're teaching um, and, and he's kind of out of there at that point. Um, so you can see with this kid, we um, backed off on the demands and went back to very uh, limited uh, instructions and sort of fading them in slowly. And we were able to get um, back to stage 10 very, very quickly with this kid. And some of our kids look like this. <laughs> well, we don't have a problem at all. And you might say, well, then why in the world would you do it? And the reason is because I feel pretty strongly about that social impairment, social relatedness, hallmark feature of autism. So even if I have a kid who's not resistant, um, isn't engaging in problem behavior, I still feel pretty strongly about developing um, sort of that social interaction piece. And um, so we're going to do it with kids that look like this as well. Almost all. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so she asked, do we use this procedure with, with all of our kids? And the answer is yes. Some progress through incredibly quickly. I mean, it's three sessions, we move on. Three sessions, we move on. Three sessions, we move on. Because they, they're not resistant, you know, or we're not having to make any decisions um, as, in terms of staying where we are. Others, um, it, can take, it can take a long time. There's some graphs I did want to show, but, you know, it's so long that it was really difficult to really read. Um, and those are kids who have a really lengthy negative learning history in instructional settings. And it takes a long time to, to abolish that CMOR. Um, we do have some kids for whom it doesn't work. There's a small por portion of kids that I see that we continue to see problem behavior and they will not come and sit down. And for those kids, we do make a decision to use an extinction-based procedure. It's an evidence-based procedure and it does work and it is used when it's needed. Um, but, but if we can avoid using that, then, then we will. Yes? Um, so Just a question on your phases. Can you turn me off? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. Um, so when you're increasing the demands from, I think you said, phase five through ten, yep. do you keep those, the criteria to move from one to one is still the low levels of inappropriate behavior and high levels of in-seat, in seat, but do you keep that criteria the same for each phase? And as you're moving that up, are you introducing a few demands at a time or are you decreasing the schedule of reinforcement. So um, how the, does that sort of work? The schedule of reinforcement stays incredibly dense throughout yeah. all of yeah. this, I would say, because we're doing tons of man mm -hmm. trials with almost all of our kids. I would say um, this protocol is incredibly idiosyncratic. So we have essentially what we do is we have a general protocol. This is generally what we're going to do with all of our kids. But based on our VB map assessment and just our experiences in the sort of the first day, we may make decisions one way or the other just based on clinical experience. So for some kids, you know, we start with one demand every two minutes. 
in the beginning, and then we might progress to one demand every minute and 45 seconds, minute and a half. And other kids, you might start with a demand every two minutes, and it just looks awesome, and you go to one every 30 seconds, and then two every 30 seconds, and then you're very quickly changing. Now it's not just all mastered stuff, it's acquisition stuff. And I think that, that a, a good clinician really should feel the, should be using their clinical skill to make those case-to-case decisions and that's one reason why I didn't put up a, a research protocol here because all of these kids looked a little bit different what we did yeah there's a thing right here okay uh, is there somewhere we can access a description of the phases 1 through 10 uh, <laughs> um, yeah uh, well there's nothing um, published as of yet um, but I certainly wouldn't mind um, being contacted by email if um, I don't know how to, okay, great, perfect. Should I answer another? Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, okay, let's see, a question, um, the nature of the materials to use during this initial process. How do you identify the materials to make available? How do we reduce the likelihood that we won't satiate the child early on? Um, that's a great question, I think, um, what I didn't talk about is that we do uh, that we do assess for uh, preferred items to identify some possible reinforcers. We do that pretty standard ways, an interview with the parent prior to admission. And also um, on that first day, we actually do some um, a ton of just ob observing. What is this child like? What is he or she not like? And then we also sometimes will do a more um, structured preference assessment to identify some of the highest preferred. Now I will say we also have had some kids in the past who their favorite things, the things that they want to play with and interact with are not conducive to playing in the session room. I can't bring the trampoline to the teaching table and I can't bring the slide from the playground. And for some of those kids we make different decisions that if that's what they're, they're um, we're trying to pair ourselves with, then we're not in the therapy room at all. We're actually out on the playground. So there, uh, there's always going to be variations that you're going to have to to think about doing with the kids that you actually, inter um, that you serve. Okay. Um, so, I'm, I'm actually doing pretty good. I think I'm getting into the third topic. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so the last topic that I wanted to talk about, um, um, well, I have one more question about the pairing, so let me just look at this. What about a child that during pairing only comes over to the table for brief periods of time to get access to the food person activity briefly and then leaves the table area again? child may have a long history of negative pairing with the table, would love to see this child come to the table and sit on his own, but even with all the preferred items and activities at the table, the child will frequently leave for long periods of time. Yes, that does happen. So essentially what, um, what I like to think about that first, so the first phase, it's, it's non-contingent, it's anywhere in the room. So all the toys are on the table and I come and play, but then if I want to take it with me, we let them and we go with them wherever they go. In the second phase, now it's I want to get up and you're allowed to get up. We're not going to prevent you from getting up, but if you try to take the toys, we're just going to tell you, you know, this has to stay at the table. And we let the child sort of experience the, the contingencies. The contingencies are... I get up and I do nothing, I come here and I get something. I get up and I do nothing, I come here and I get something. And sometimes we see that back and forth for a long time. It takes some sessions for them to experience the difference there before we start to see kids starting to make the choice to come over um, and sit at the table and starting to stay. But we do sometimes see kids who come over, get the edible and they're gone, come over, get the edible and they're gone. And then that's when the next phase comes in where now it's not just coming over, it's coming over and behind in the chair. And so now that is the next sort of level of, of the contingency. Um, and sometimes we start to see some problems with that. And again, I think you have to, you have to use the other tools that we as behavior analysts have. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And for some kids, we do end up using some other types of procedures overlaid on top of this if we start to see kids that aren't um, just kind of, I say, conforming. <laughs> but we, you know, if we start to see continued um, difficulties sitting, then we're going to use the other strategies that we know are going to work. Okay. 
So the last um, topic that I kind of want to talk about are motivating operations as e independent variables when you're teaching MANs. Um, everybody in here and probably everybody online knows the importance of MAN training. It's sort of a, I mean, if you don't, it, you're behind. You're behind. <laughs> um, and there's tons of research in this area. There was so much research that I didn't even really put the references here because there's just tons of, of studies on teaching mans for preferred items, teaching mans for missing items, mans for information, mans for escape. There's just a lot out there. Um, and so what we're talking about when we're talking about motivating operations as independent variables are essentially um, looking at the antecedents to specific verbal behavior that you're trying to teach. So what this might look like um, is there's an EO, uh, I want to go somewhere but I can't find my keys. So my verbal behavior might be where are my keys. Um, and the reinforcer is information on the location of my keys. Um, which is very different from I want to eat some popcorn, I don't know how to use the microwave, so I say how do I turn on the microwave? That somebody gives me information about how to use the microwave and now I can make my popcorn. Or if you're on the playground, um, there's a kid playing with a toy that you like and you don't know that kid. Um, the EO is there's an unknown peer that I would like to know. I go over and I say, what's your name? The peer tells me his name. So it's just information. Or potentially somebody's in your way, something's uh, blocking your view. Uh, maybe it's Thanksgiving Day, you're trying to watch the game and Uncle Bob is standing in front of the TV. You say, move please, he gets out of the way. Um, and, and this is pretty common. I think we all know how to contrive EOs to teach mans. This is, this is not new stuff. But the issue is how do we ensure that the response that we're teaching is actually under the control of the EO? How do we ensure that it's the EO that is responsible for evoking that mand? How do we know? And that's what we're going to talk about um, for the last little bit of this presentation. Now previous research has all contrived EOs. You're not going to see a man study now <laughs> where there isn't some evidence that an EO has been contrived. But the limitation to this point, I think, has been that abolishing operations have been underemphasized. They have not been included often in the arrangements of contriving the EO. And so there hasn't been a systematic integration of EO conditions and AO conditions to show that the response that you're getting occurs only when the EO is present and not when an AO is present. And we haven't really seen that in the literature that much. Um, and so clinically, practically, when you guys are out teaching MANs, if you're teaching MANs only when the EO is present, you have to consider the possibility that with all of the other antecedents that are present, that there might be something else that's controlling the response that you think you just taught. Um, sight of the item. So we are teaching in the presence of an EO for a cookie. Cookie comes out, sign for cookie, child gets the cookie. Um, but what if the next time the cookie comes out and there's no EO for cookie, you still get a sign for cookie. That's a, a response that is under faulty control. We thought it was under control of the EO, but actually is under control of the sight of the item. Or verbal stimulus. So potentially um, there's something in the environment that uh, verbally is said um, and that's actually what's controlling the EO. And this is going to result in some faulty control of the response. I'm going to give you some examples. So essentially what that would look like is, let's say we want to go somewhere and there are no keys and I ask where. Well let's say we want to go somewhere and I have my keys in my hand. If I say where are my keys, something's wrong. We didn't actually teach a manned where. We just taught a response where. And it's not actually functioning as a manned. And this would apply to all of these situations. If somebody says move please and nobody's in their way, they're not using that manned or that response, I guess in this case, successfully. So what I want to talk about are just some examples of how to program EO and AO conditions when teaching to assess that you've actually taught a functional, a functional manned. So I'm going to get, take you through a couple of studies that we actually, uh, one is already out and published and then two, um, all signs are looking good. <laughs> so we're kind of in the process and hopefully these papers will be out um, uh, relatively soon. Uh, so let's talk about teaching mans for information using who and which. And really, even though what I'm teaching here and we're going to talk about is who and which, this really, I'm not really trying to tell you how to teach who and which. What I'm trying to um, 
to, to get across is how important it is to assess the right control of the response. Um, and it could be applied to any man th uh, topography that you're teaching. So um, just really, really quickly, um, we uh, contrived both an EO present and an EO absent condition in order to control the man who and which. Um, in the EO present condition, what we did was um, we determined that there was an EO for a particular item and then we hid that item. And then during the EO present uh, condition, we gave information regarding, uh, or the information regarding the location of the item was not given. So now I have an EO for, for which cup or which cabinet or which whatever, wherever it's hidden. Um, so we contrived a, a motivation for information on who has my toy or which cabinet the toy is in. In the EO absent condition, we readily gave the information, so they already had it. So instead of saying, somebody has your toy, we said, Diane has your toy. So now there's no motivation to ask who has it. There shouldn't be because the EO is abolished, so it's an abolishing operation, basically. And so what we're looking for is to see whether or not the child asks who has it and which only when the EO is present and refrains from asking when the AO is present. So when I already have the information, if I'm saying who or which, oh really? Oh no. <laughs> okay, how many more minutes? You're kind of in the red now. Oh no. Okay, can we just watch some, let's just watch some videos. Okay. Ooh. Oh, I'm not even doing the right thing. I'm supposed to do this. Let's just really quickly watch like a couple of videos of how you might contrive this and then I will be totally done. So what happened there was he asked for tape. He likes to tape his Mr. Potato Head body parts on. Uh, <laughs> So he asked for tape and she said, she says, yes, it's in the red cup. So that's an example of an EO absent condition. He doesn't have to ask which cup because he already knows which cup. I'm glad I prepared a thousand videos. <laughs> So this is baseline. He says tape. She says it's in one of the cups. He can't access it because he doesn't know. He doesn't know. Um, so now let's just take a look at what this might look like. Okay, sure. Your tape is under one of these cups. Say which cup? Which? The purple cup. And now yeah, she provides the information. And he says which? And then we can take a look like at it, guy, what it looks I'll like. Put this guy together and then put this guy together. Okay, sure. Your tape is under one of these cups. Which cup? What cup? So yeah. now we've got an independent response there. Like but guy. the most important thing is that, um, whoa, I can't do it. It's too much stress. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Why isn't it working? Okay, there we go. Um, the most important thing, and I guess I don't have time to go through any of this, is that what we didn't want to have happen was where we're seeing him say which in the EO, ab in the EO absent condition. So if he just rotely says which or who or how, then even though we're seeing the data path go up under EO conditions and we're feeling good, 100%, he's saying which, if we're also seeing which in the EO absent condition, you know we haven't taught a functional skill. And so it's really important, I think, as you're thinking about your programs and thinking about your motivational variables that you are um, uh, contri contriving both EO absent and EO present conditions to teach and to assess. Um, and we'll just end it there. Okay.